Okay. So um, I want to thank um, Giovanna and Dupree for giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk. As I was saying, um, this, I, I think this talk is extremely timely. It, this is something, the, um, the notion of making electronic health records data Duke accessible has been a strong interest of groups I've been part of here in the School of Medicine. Um, and there has been a lot of development over the past, really just even few months um, in making this process better. Um, so just for some context of myself, I'm faculty, as Giovanna mentioned, in Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. And most of my work is around um, methodologically, how best do we work with electronic health records? What are challenges and opportunities in, in working with, with, with these data? They're, I find them to be a really exciting data source. Um, I've probably been working with them. I was randomly introduced to them about eight years ago or so. and um, started on one project and have since really gotten hooked and just have found a, a myriad of really exciting and interesting opportunities. And in my time here one of the, at Duke, one of my big interests has been how do we make these data more accessible to more researchers? Uh, I think the wealth of questions we can ask and answer with these data extend far beyond just clinical questions. Uh, um, some collaborations that, that I'm doing with, um, with Giovanna and her group are really look, are much more around demography and sociology. And I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities um, to use these data. So I'm really excited to see kind of the, the and I'm not, and not surprised to see the, the breadth of people who are here today. Uh, just as a brief outline, um, I'd say the first two, half to two thirds of the talk will be more about what are EHR data, um, the structure of them, some analytic challenges. Um, if you're really interested in this final topic, and I would understand about how we access EHR data, I, and I completely understand um, if you want to tune out for the next 45 minutes, minutes or so, you're more than welcome to. And then the last 20, 30 minutes or so, we'll really talk about what are options for, for gaining direct access to, to EHR data. Um, so just to really start from the basics, um, so what are electronic health records? Um, uh, um, there's lots of different definitions. Um, I like this very general definition from CMS, which is an electronic health record is an electronic version of a patient's medical history that's maintained by the provider over time. It's clean, it's simple, but it, it, and it's very general. Um, it's, so it's really, it's a compendium of what is the information that we see about patients who come to see a, a clinical care provider. Um, the, the reason there's been such a growth of EHR data over the past decade is that a, a part of, of the stimulus, if we remember our last re re recession, um, there was what was called the High Tech Act, which was part of the 2009 stimulus and was geared to incentivize the use of, of EHRs. Um, in the literature, um, in, you'll, you'll often see EHRs used synonymously with EMRs, electronic medical records. Um, in, the, in Europe, particularly, you'll see the, the reference to, to patient health record, um, PHR. Um, I had a, an early mentor who really liked prefer the term EHR over EMR because to him, the, um, saying health record as opposed to medical record really highlighted the fact that it was a record that was holding on to not just medical information, but all aspects of health. So I, so in, in, um, so when I talk about it, when I write about um, EHR data, I'm, I'm very particular to, to only use the EHR moniker for, for that reason, but they're, they're exactly synonymous with each other. Um, this, you know, as I mentioned, so here we have, we've had EHRs for a while. Duke has had an EHR system. Uh, I want to say the first EHR systems go back to the 70s. Duke has had an EHR system since the 80s. Um, here is where we have the High Tech Act and we see, and this is only going back to 20, up to 2015, but we see um, just this, this continual growth of, of the use of EHR systems. Um, there, it's important to keep knowing, and we're not going to go in, I'm not going to go at all into this, but I, I want to make sure it's clear that there's, that there's a lot of different vendors for EHR. So um, the, the vendor that we use here at Duke is Epic. Um, th this is the largest vendor for academic or large medical centers. Um, all, but then you have a lot of different types of vendors, particularly health specific vendors. So all scripts is a vendor for, for prescription medication. Um, a, um, we, you have vendor Cerner is, is another um, academic healthcare um, one. Um, pr practice Fusion is, is more for, for outpatient practices. So the you can almost think about EHR vendors as different types of operating systems. You have Microsoft, you have Apple, um, and and in the same way you have a lot of different types of EHR vendors which create their own types of platforms. Um, 
this is just a, a kind of a, a, a generic screenshot. This is not what we see in the front of it, but this is a, a, an illustration of what a doctor here um, that you're dealing with a, uh, in a medical appointment will see and, and will be interacting with. So um, it's, th this becomes a way for the doctor to be able to organize all of the, all of the patient's information. So what we have is information on the patient in front of us. We have, um, you know, we, we have an address. Um, we made the information on what, um, what, what's been ordered here. This patient was ordered an, an, an EKG. Here's some information on billing. Um, you can click on tabs to look at prescriptions. You can cl click on tabs to look at what kind of lab information. But the entire notion of, of, of an EHR is, um, well, I would argue that there's two big goals of an EHR. In a cynical view, um, you can say that it's to organize it for, for billing and to make billing more efficient, and that is definitely a big part of EHR data. Um, in, in a less cynical view, um, it's a way to make care more efficient and to pro provide information back to doctors and providers so that they can better get um, collate the information that they have on their patients. Um, I, I always think back to my father, who is, an, who is a surgeon and has hundreds and hundreds of paper charts and filing cabinets and I can't imagine how you would actually look up an older patient and get information on them. This becomes a way to, to organize that information. But one of the themes that I'll, I'll talk about here is that what's, what, what, what I'm not mentioning was an intention of EHR data is to organize it for, for research purposes. And so uh, newer EHR systems, Google's starting to get involved in the EHR space and they're thinking about this now for, for research. But the original EHR systems, they were not designed to make researchers' lives, our lives, be easier. And, and, and that does raise some, some various challenges throughout that it's important to be cognizant of. Um, the back end of this, and, and, and this is actually a, um, it's a slightly older illustration of the architecture here at Duke, um, of what the back end of the EHR system looks like. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide, and really the, the point of this slide is, not, is to make it clear how how complicated this really all is. Um, it's, it's, you, we, we have our enterprise data warehouse, we have modules that work off it, we have different data sources that are going in, um, the, and, and, and the data are flowing through lo lots of different places. Um, it's Once you appreciate the fact of, of the complexity of the back end, um, it becomes clear why we can't just say, let's give people access to EHR data. If, it, it, it's really not a possibility. And there to get access to these modules, um, for example, the, the Clarity backend of Epic, you need to go up to Verona, Wisconsin, which is the headquarters of Epic, take an approximately $10,000 training and become certified. And that ha and, and there's a lot of actually, it, it's not just a money maker. For, it, it, there's really good logistic reasons why that needs to happen. You're, you're, you're working in the back end of an extremely messy infrastructure. And, you, and if you, work around in there and you don't really know what you're doing, you, you can cause some problems. And so, um, the, so really the, the goal of the, the health information to technology services here at Duke is not to give people access to this backend, but to try to create services and to create abstractions of the data that are easier um, and accessible for folks to use. Um, this kind of gives another illustration of what we have um, in, in terms of what the how the data are organized. Um, so this is a, about the, the, the Epic backend. So this is again what we use here at Duke. Um, you, there is a, a, actually a series of different layers of Epic. So we have what, what's called chronicles, which are data that are stored immediately. These are stored in a very raw, disorganized form, and there's about 95,000 data elements. These data are organized overnight. Um, into a system called Clarity. You um, you'll often may hear people um, talk about Clarity data. Um, this is still quite complicated. There's about 17,000 tables. A number of those tables are deprecated, but there are 17,000 tables. So if you don't know what, what you're looking for, you probably won't find it. Um, and th th that's 17,000 tables over about 125,000 columns. Um, there is a newer offering by Epic to uh, simplify this a little bit more into what's called Caboodle. Um, Caboodle um, takes those 17,000 tables, organizes them into about 19 tables and about 76 dimensions. So um, this is something that is much easier and much more accessible for folks to work with. Um, from here, we can start thinking about now what can we do with the data? We can create things like disease-specific re registries. Um, we have things like the diabetes registry and atrial fibrillation registry. We can create analytic tools, provider dashboards, predictive models, etc. cetera. 
So the, the, the key here is that the data with which you're dealing with are not necessarily the rawest of, 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 of the raw data. And the reason I, I, I like to really illustrate, talk about this is because when I first started working with EHR data, particularly EHR data here at Duke, I would tell the people who can provide me data, I would just say, just give me the data. Give me, you know, I, I, you know, they'd ask me what I wanted and I'd say, you know, don't make any choices for me, just give me all the data. You know, you know, being a naive statistician, I kind of thought I wanted everything and I would make all my choices. And um, I, I had a, 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 I have a friend who works in the team and she, pro she provided me the data and, and, and I realized, and she, she laughed at me when I came back and said, I can't do anything with this. And, and that was kind of the beginning of my insights and realization that we need to deal with some of these abstractions. We, we can't deal with data here, or really even data here. We need to deal with data in, in, in some more organized ways. And, and when I get towards the end about how we access data, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how some of those tools we've created here at Duke allow you to more efficiently deal with data. Um, I'm hoping, um, okay. Uh, so what I'm going to go through now are really just a almost a tour of uh, of various types of data elements um, and just kind of to give you a sense as to what's actually in, within the HR um, and hopefully get you excited about working with, with some of these data. Um, so the most basic form of data that we have um, are demographic data. Um, each patient have a single ID um, that follows them across all encounters. This is referred to as an, a medical record number or an MRN. Um, it, is possible that um, a patient will come in and if they're coming in an emergency context, they, a, a new MRN, there won't be time to look them up in the system um, and a new MRN will be generated for them. Um, there's about five, and, and then, and, and there's actually software that operates within here and, and there's some projects I've been involved in here where what we actually look for is duplicated MRNs. And I wanna say about every month, there's about 3000 or so duplicated MRNs that are created where the, where the charts need to get remerged together. Um, you know, from, again, from a researcher perspective, that seems you know, crazy and why would you do that? But from a healthcare provision perspective, if someone's coming in an emergency, you don't really wanna waste the time of figuring out, do I have a chart on them? You just wanna get them into the system and begin working on them. Um, so you just create a new MRN for them. The, um, the demographics cover your basic information, your age, your sex, your, um, your race, ethnicity. These are typically static. Um, you can think about your time varying elements, um, who the payer is for that encounter, um, was that paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, um, Blue Cross, what your address is, um, particularly when we think about population health, knowing where people are living is extremely powerful and important. Um, the next level of information that um, is important for most analyses are encounter types. Um, so it, encounters have, um, have an encounter ID um, th that links the encounter to, to what happened. So, um, and, and that's kind of where we start getting into the meat or the, uh, of the guts of what we really care about. We can think about three basic types of encounters. Um, there are eight outpatient encounters, um, which may also be referred to as ambulatory visits. We will have inpatient encounters. So that's a, an encounter in the, in the hospital. And then we'll have a, a emergency de department encounters. Um, and obviously a lot of these can flow together. So you may start in the emergency room and then you get transferred into the inpatient. You may have an encounter that starts in, in urgent care in an outpatient setting, and then you're told to go to, um, to, to the hospital. So we can follow people across these encounters. Um, particularly now in, in the time of COVID, but even before COVID, um, there were, um, we can think about other types of encounters, telephone consults, emails. Um, these are all, these again, these are all captured. So every time you email your doctor, um, that, that's captured within this system. As we move to an era of, of video consults, all that, again, all that information will be captured. In now we need to think about as researchers, how do we organize that information and use it um, and study the effects of those. Um, we, when we think about um, information for encounters, we can ask questions about, um, for example, when someone was seen. So we often have timestamps for arrival and departure. We can think about who the patient saw, um, so who the provider was the, um, and the provider type. We can know where the patient was seen, the clinic location, the, the, the type of facility, and we can think about what happened, um, the, the vital signs that were taken, the labs that were taken, the diagnoses made. Um, the, important, the most important thing, though, that we don't have is we don't have good information on why. Um, and it's we and the reason for that is that um, while we have diagnoses, those don't often relate to a, ch a chief complaint. So there isn't, a, unfortunately, a structured field really within the EHR that says why is the patient here. 
um, that finds itself in notes, that finds itself in, within a clinical narrative. And while there has been a lot of advancements, um, and a lot of advancements, particularly here at Duke, um, within the AI space of doing natural language processing and analyzing those notes, um, it's not, those data don't exist in what we'd call a structured or easy to, to, to access form. Um, we can understand the when, the who, the where, and the what, but that why is, is much harder to, to infer. Um, as we move into the encounter, we can, we can start thinking about, okay, so how do we actually code what happens? So um, a number of you may have heard about, heard of what are called ICD codes or International Classification of Disease Codes. Um, this is a hierarchical system to code all diagnoses that are made during a health encounter. Um, so this kind of re refers to, um, it, it can give you a notion of why someone is in here, but also relates to kind of what's, what's going on with them. Um, in 2015, the U.S. switched to the ICD version 10. Um, previously, we were on ICD ver version 9. This, um, this switch happened in October of 2015. Um, and I, I, in Europe, this happened a little bit earlier. We're already in the process of switching, of looking at what ICD-11 will look like. Um, and this, again, this has made researchers' lives incredibly complicated, but it's also what keeps um, researchers in, in business or academics in business. Um, so ICD-9 had 13,000 unique codes, where ICD-10 had has 68,000 thousand unique codes. Um, and I'd love to say that there are some direct mappings here, um, at, at least a, a one to, to many, but th there isn't even a, a, a one to many here. So there is, so this process of mapping between ICD-9 and ICD-10 in some contexts can be quite challenging. Um, it's important to know that since these are often used as billing codes, so this is this is the, the basis for our healthcare reimbursement system. Um, the codes can be manipulated to increase billing. Um, it's what is interesting. I was working with folks over at Duke um, Singapore and, and their health system there, and actually one of their complaints that they had from a research perspective is that because diagnosis codes are not attached to, to, build, to, to billing in, in Singapore, there is actually very poor capture of diagnosis codes. So, so one of the side effects, if you will, of, of our healthcare system and, and, and the billing system for our healthcare is that bec there is, because there's such an incentive structure to get these diagnosis codes right and accurate, they actually get these codes right to, for, to make money, they, they actually are quite accurate. You move to a system that, that, that doesn't have that type of incentive structure, there isn't, you, doctors aren't going to be coding in the same way. So we have at Duke teams of people whose job is to make sure that the diagnosis codes are accurately reflect what happened. Um, so there's a much different fidelity than what you may have in a different type of healthcare system. Um, but again, it's important to know that these don't always represent the, the primary concern of, of the encounter. Um, to try to understand a little bit more about this, so this is the structure of, of, of ICD-10. Um, the beginning starts with, uh, always starts with a letter. Um, this is new in ICD-10. We'll have two numerics, a decimal point, and then more numbers. Um, and I mentioned this is a hierarchical system. So we may say I-21 re refers to acute myocardial infarction, um, where subsequent numbers will, will designate the location of the event. So I-21.01 um, would designate that this is a, an MI of, of the left main coronary artery, 0.02 may designate something, um, a, a different part of the MI. Um, as researchers, we don't typically care about where in the, the heart that, that myocardial infarction occurred. So what we'll often say is all I care about is the I-21 stem. So um, in, in, in encoding language, even you say I-21 star. Um, and, and anything that comes after this, I want to, if I want to find someone with a myocardial infarction, anyone that starts with an I-21, but as, as you're thinking about this as how you may code this out or pull these data, you need to be cognizant of that that may be 0 0.01, 0 0.02, or just I-21 with just a stem. I-22 would be a subsequent MIs. I-23 are complications of an MI. So there's a, there is an order and a logic structure. Um, I'm going to try to pull up the a more specific example about, so here we, so this is a website I often find myself on um, where I need to look up codes. So we'll look at, so we want to look at I-21 and then we can look at where, and now we can see, um, so this should give me all of my different, so this gives me information on these codes and, and all the different codes that are r related to it. And now I have all my different stems. So I have my I-21.0, which is for interior walls, O1, left main, um, O2, le um, left interior, um, all, basically all different parts of the heart where that um, heart attack 
occurred. So again, if in general, I, I would, I would think I would trust that that I twenty one stem is quite accurate. Um, the fidelity of this may, may be a little bit less, and 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 this may not be coded as directly because this first part is really where the importance, again, for, from a billing perspective, um, comes in. Okay, um, we can think about rolling up codes as well. Um, so dealing with 68,000 unique codes is not realistic or efficient. Um, when there's a, a number of different um, proposals for how p codes can be rolled up, um, the the one that I find myself particularly using the most is one that was developed by ARC um, called the Clinical Classification Software System or CCS. Um, and it allows researchers to roll up codes to um, to appropriate level. So you can say, give me all, this is a way to say, give me all the codes that relate to coronary disease. And now you can say, because all I care about is, does my patient have a history of cardiovascular disease? I want it to say, give, these are the suite of codes I care about. Or do I care about, um, or give me all the codes that relate to a bacterial infection. And now you can, and, and this gives you ways of, of grouping codes together again, to make life as a researcher a little bit more efficient. Um, we, there, so, so ICD codes are, are diagnosis codes for what um, essentially we think is wrong with the patient. Then we also have what are called CPT codes or current procedural terminology codes, which really relate to what happened during encounter. So this may include surgeries, x-rays, et cetera. Um, there's about 10,000 in use. Um, these are also tied to reimbursements. Um, and again, there's similar systems for organizing um, CPTs as there are for, for ICDs. I'm not gonna go into as much detail, but again, it, it's, so we have codes for, um, for the diagnoses that are made. We have codes for, for various procedures or things that happen to patients. Um, we uh, another table of interest, if you will, are medications. So um, Epic has over 100 medication-related tables. So it's not just as simple as saying I want to look at the medications. You want to know where, what kind of medications I want to be looking at. A lot of the reason we have these different tables is because medications can come from different places. So I may think about what medications were ordered, but if that order happened in the hospital or happened at an outpatient clinic um, or was referred in, um, that th those data need to be organized in a slightly different way in, in the back end. So as a researcher, I may not care about um, all those nuances of where those data come from. I just want to know what orders that does a patient have, but on a back end system, we need to we need to keep these a little bit more organized and spread out. Typically, we can think about um, medications in three different ways. What medications were prescribed? Um, this is, um, again, that's not taken, so we don't often see good information on what was taken by the patient or even bought by the patient, but what was ordered by the doctor. So almost more of an intent by the doctor. Medications that were administered, this would be, for example, in the hospital, if you were given an IV antibiotic, that'd be an administered medication. And then we also have what's called medication re reconciliation. So every time you go to your doctor and the doctor asks you, are you, are you still taking this drug? That, is, that finds its way into a, a medication re reconciliation table. Um, while we while we do have dosage information, uh, and a lot of times in my experience, that information is captured with less fidelity than the actual order itself. Um, so we have good information typically about what was ordered. Um, the dosages are not uh, can be a little bit messier. So depending on how important it is for your research study, um, you want to be careful about how you're working with that. Um, and again, we there's a lot um, like diagnoses and procedures. Medications can become overly granular. So there are systems in place for organizing and rolling these up. Um, the one that I tend to use the most is was developed by the National Library of Medicine, part of um, NIH, is called RX Norm, um, and this gives again a way of, of creating a hierarchical system. For, for understanding medication. So this is the Rx norm page for acetaminophen, commonly known as Tylenol. Um, and all of the, so this here, um, this 1041528 is the Rx norm code for acetaminophen 10 milligrams per mil. There's a slightly different, there's a different code for 100 milligrams per mil. There's a different, and um, so, I may not, if again, as a researcher, I may all I maybe care about is was my was my patient prescribed acetaminophen? I don't care about particularly the dosages. So I may want to do my query and say, pull all of the data that has any of these Rx norm or what we call it's called Rx QE codes. Um, we can also think about these in again within a hierarchical system. Uh, okay, yeah. So you can think you can think about these within a hierarchical system. 
where we have acetaminophen. Um, acetaminophen is, these are, are kind of class of, of opioids or an, analgesiacs, and we can, we can look at data within the hierarchy. So if I wanted all analgesiacs, uh, I can click into here. Um, if I wanted all versions of acetaminophen or tramadol or, or acetaminophen and codeine, I can look in, in here as well. So there, again, there's different ways of thinking about these data within a hierarchical structure that will change depending on the research use or research question that you have in mind. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, laboratory tests and, and, and results. So, um, so I'd say that the first sets of data, that, you know, your demographics, your um, your billing codes, your CPT codes, even your medications, these are not particularly unique to EHR data. So for anyone who's worked with administrative data, um, things, data that maybe come from insurance companies, come from Medicare, Medicaid, you'll often see these data, um, you'll, you'll see things in a little bit more granularity with the EHR data, you won't often see dosages within administrative data. Um, you may not get addresses or, or some of the, the refined information from, an, from administrative data, but you'll see a lot of this information where, where EHR data be, start becoming really unique and, and, and powerful or when we start talking about some of these other data um, sources. So um, laboratory test results are, are, are one particular one that really begin, and, and vitals are the other, which really begin to differentiate EHR data from administrative data. And particularly what's interesting about these data from a research perspective is that this is really what differentiates a what happened, what a doctor did from what is actually going on with the patient? What is the underlying condition? Of, what, what does the patient look like clinically? And it can start opening up the door to, to research studies that not only look at what does the doctor think, because a diagnosis code is only as good as what as, is only as good as the doctor. If the doctor misses the diagnosis and do, or or doesn't do the right procedure, then you're not going to see it. But if you have the these other clinical variables as a researcher, you can start thinking about well, what what else seems to be going on, and maybe can I find some that some other clue or signal in the data that wasn't there based on on what the doctor saw. Um, now, the caveat in that is, of course, and this is something that within our within my research group we've studied a fair bit, is that that's still conditional, if you will, on the doctor performing the lab test. So there is still this notion of intention um, and informativeness within the data um, that if you know that someone's lab value may be out of range, but if the lab test was never taken, we'll never see it. So it, it, it's not a perfection, but it does give us more insight into the patient condition. Um, as we think about these data, um, it's important to note that there may be multiple test panels um, used, which, which can be labeled differentially. Um, modern systems have standardized nomenclature of, of laboratory test results. Um, Duke itself has a catalog of the laboratory tests that are used. Um, so this is found here at testcatalog.duke.edu. And if you did a search, for example, for creatinine, which is a typical lab test to look for um, a kidney function, you will find, um, what's nice is we have these lab codes. So you can look for any of these lab codes. Um, the problem is that if you're not a clinician and I'm not a clinician, I, I, I can't tell you the difference between all of these creatinine lab tests, um, you may end up looking at the wrong one. So um, this is really where I start emphasizing um, the, the importance of having good team science so that you are, you, 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 you're working hand in hand with somebody who has a deeper understanding and maybe knows the difference between a creatinine and the creatinine whole blood and a creatinine four, four hour load. Um, I personally don't know the differences. It may be that they all tell you one and the same. It may be that they tell you something slightly different. Um, so it's, so just looking for a creatinine test, it, it, it is not as, as simple as you would think it, it, it could be. Okay. Um, typically, we see timestamps for when a test was ordered and resulted. Um, and an analytic concern is that these, um, so, and, so that can again become really powerful if we're thinking about data, particularly within an inpatient setting. Um, we, can, we, can, we see a lot of the timing of things. That's again a distinction from administrative data, where you just kind of see a summary of, of the encounter. Um, and, and an analytic concern is that these measurements are often irregularly captured across encounters. So that's where that informativeness comes in, where it, um, as a researcher, I would love that you had your creatinine taken at every health encounter. In reality, your creatinine is really only going to be measured um, when the doctor thinks it, it ought to be measured. 
Okay. Um, vital signs are, are similar to, um, to, to lab tests. And again, it's what really what begins to differentiate EHR data. Um, most enc encounters will capture things like blood pressure, weight, and temperature. Um, in the hospital, um, vitals may be documented every couple of hours. So some of the um, projects I've worked on, particularly around predictive modeling, will, will really utilize this aspect that we're seeing a patient's blood pressure every two hours, and then we'll use that to develop models for um, risk of decompensation or, or, or risk of mortality, because we're seeing what's changing in a patient over time. As we start thinking about other areas of the hospital, so for um, sort of patients who are in the intensive care unit or the ICU, monitors can capture very dense data. Um, so I'm currently working on a project right now where we're looking at ICU data for traumatic brain injury. Um, we know we'll, we're gonna have data stored on a minute by minute date aspect. And for some of these um, vitals, we can get these even at, at a waveform level. So for those who are, are, are interested in more like a signal processing perspective, you can get really dense granular information on how these vitals are evolving um, in, in, in continuous time. Um, the data themselves will often be stored in what are um, in long running tallies called flow sheets, um, which are they're they're a very general data structure that is a that's very that's efficient for capturing things as they occur, um, but they're not very, again, they make life challenging as a researcher. I was talking to a colleague yesterday um, who had to deal with, um, with flow sheet data and just kind of walking through that, that the, the challenge of these. Um, they, they are not organized, again, with, with the researcher in mind. They're organized with the mindset of how do we just efficiently, as quickly as possible, store a running tally of every minute what your blood pressure is. Um, again, be, um, as we start broadening out now from the medical to really the, the, the larger notion of health, we can think about things like social health. Um, so data such as smoking status, drug and alcohol use, employment status, marital status, et cetera, um, th there are fields for all of these. Um, um, they may be reported, they may be, um, it's, I would personally consider them unreliable. Um, I've used them in studies here or there. Um, it's something, to, to me, this is where you start getting into that caveat emptor of, you know, know what you're getting into, um, do some quality ch checking of the, of the data. Um, in general, I would presume that if something is there, it's correct. Um, it's, it, you know, a, someone's, would not be listed as having being a smoker. Typically, if they're not a smoker, it's more the opposite that may not be uh, incorrect. So it, it, the absence of something, typically we have to rely on the absence of something, meaning that it doesn't exist. And, and so if the absence of an MI in my health record is probably a good indication that I've never had an MI. The absence of drug and alcohol use in my health record may, may or may not indicate that I, that I have a history of drug and alcohol use. I personally don't have a history of drug and alcohol use, but um, but that being said, um, um, so socioeconomic status um, typically um, doesn't exist. Um, but again, as we start thinking about population health, there's, there are some really powerful proxies that we can use. Um, we so we've done um, with, with a colleague here. We've done studies looking at Duke. Um, we found that really just even knowing something about primary payer um, and one's socioeconomic status, um, tell, uh, sorry, primary payer and race tells you a lot about that their socioeconomic status. Um, so if someone is, is on Medicare, um, then um, sorry. On Medicaid, then they're more likely to, to be poor. Um, also, neighborhood addresses can be quite powerful. Uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of studies lately of leveraging um, things like American Community Survey data, where you can map where somebody lives and then use ACS data to get an understanding of, of their neighborhood SES. Um, there's also growing emphasis on capturing patient reported outcomes um, or PROs. Again, these are not being captured, these are not being collected with consistency, but I think uh, over the, uh, I think in the coming years, we're going to see these um, growing more and more things like metrics for food insecurity. Um, the promise is a, is a very popular metric, pain inventories, d depression inventories. And again, this is where I think data start becoming really interesting and powerful as we get more in, we get more context of not just the medical situation of the patient, but the overall health status of the patient. Um, there's lots of other data elements, um, and I don't want to, you know, bore you by kind of going through in, in, in too much detail and everything. Um, we have we have notions of what are called problem lists. These are date stamped indicators for when someone has different conditions. Um, it's kind of it, it's they they're not uh, it, it's they're 
they're frustratingly unreliable because there's no, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's no notion in the EHR of, for example, who has heart disease. And the problem list is, is meant to solve that in some ways of saying you have heart disease. Um, they're just not always well captured. They're not, they're not always kept well up, up, up to date. Um, so it's, it, it, it's something that we've used at, at various times with varying degrees of, of success. Um, there is what are called ADT data or admission discharge transfer data. These are timestamps are recorded for every time a patient moves in the hospital. Again, depending on your research, this can be really powerful. So we have timestamps for when you entered the hospital, timestamps for when your surgery started, timestamps for when the anesthesia for your surgery started, timestamps for when the wound was open, timestamps for when the wound was closed, timestamps for when the anesthesia stopped, timestamps for when you were transferred in, in, into the ICU. So you get so uh, the point I'm making is that we have this very detailed information on where you are at different times in the hospital that you can really do some really interesting studies with the data depending on what you're looking at. Um, we, we have provider data information on who a patient saw it, who they interacted with. There's user data. Um, I worked with, with, with a resident on a really kind of neat project here um, where, where, where the, she wants to look at every time someone signs into Epic, a log is generated. And her research question was, well, how much time are providers spending logged into Epic and charting? And we did an interesting study looking at um, at various times, you know, at what times of day are people um, accessing the EHR system and, and doing charting and how much time are they spending? Um, again, depending on, you know, to, you know, to, you know, if th these aren't fundamentally health questions, but if you're an operations researcher, you're thinking about things in different ways, there's some really interesting data um, with which to work. Um, and finally, we can get to what we call unstructured data. Um, so structured data re re refer to, to quantitative data um, in ready to analyze format. Uh, but, but as I mentioned, there's growing emphasis on incorporating unstructured data. Um, this generally requires some type of processing. This is where um, AI, particularly deep learning methods, have become extremely, extremely powerful. Um, so what I, the way that I think about deep learning methods in, in particularly is that they are really useful when there is not a lot of noise in the data, but the signal itself is extremely complex. So we think about something like an image. There, the, the, random pixels in an image are not going to be flipped or inverted or changed around. But that, but, but, the, but the reconstruction of that image into something quantifiable is extremely complex. So things like convolutional neural networks are, are extremely powerful tools to turn that image that's unstructured into something structured. Um, so when we can think about notes. Um, the written notes are, you know, it, there's, there may be some mistakes in there, but really there's not going to be, no one's writing a note and making intentional m mistakes in there. So there's the, but that signal of what that means, that, that clinical note means, again, can be quite complex. So things like recurrent neural networks are, are, are very powerful tools. Um, there's some great pr work in progress done by, by, by your colleagues here um, around the AI Health Initiative of really trying to, to, to break down and how do we best work with these data. I'm gonna take a, so I'm not able to see any questions. Um, I, okay. You know, what I think I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll save some time towards the end and, 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 and go, through the, go through those questions. I don't wanna to pause too much. For some reason, I'm not seeing anything coming up in, in, in a chat box, I apologize. I, uh, I don't see anything either, but I okay. can read okay, so any maybe questions, no questions for you. Okay, but, okay uh, that's fine, yeah. Come in. Okay. okay. Okay, so, so, so All right. On. So there is one question. All right. Okay. Yeah. Ter Teresa Cole, if labs are sent to other locations, how are they entered back into the EHR? Yeah. So that is a great question, um, and and something that we're constantly. Um, so, the so, so fortunately here at Duke, a lot of labs are are done in house. For labs that are sent out, they are sent back. Um, in, in older times, they, those may be scanned in as PDFs, um, and then they wouldn't really exist in, in, in a structured form. Um, now they are re-entered back in. Um, so you, you may not get the results immediately. So um, for labs that are done in house, for example, we may see a lab order time of 2 p.m. and a resulting time of 4 p.m. Labs that are sent out will, will take a couple of days to come back, but they do come back now within a structured form. But as you would expect, they come back in a different type of table, which depending on your knowledge of that structure um, may be harder to find, but they but, but we we do get those struck we do get those labs that are sent out to places like LabCorp. 
Um, organizing data. So I've what, what I hope I've convinced you is that there's a lot of really interesting, exciting data to work with. What I've also hope I've kind of convinced you is that those data are going to be are, are, are not in a in a format that you're going to, no worries. Um, so so data lakes are a great way to to org are I say are a great way for in, an informat an informatics group to organize data to to make it accessible to, to high level users who kind of know that underlying organizational structure because there's, there's very few assumptions that are made about the data we're keeping it as close to that raw format as we can as possible um i while we're working so so the group that organizes data here dhts are working on apis to try to make the access to the data lake better and e not i'm not say better make it easier and easier for users um most users are going to be more interested in working with what are called data marts um data marts are data that are structured in a relational format think of like a sql database um so some kind of relational database these data are easier to, to, to access data you you typically because we have to because of the simplification we often need to make um simplification we need to make assumptions about the data we need to or we need to reduce things and bring things together in different ways. So they're, they're most typically well designed for particular use cases. So we may create, for example, a transplant data mart, which captures all the information on transplant patients, where all the transplant researchers may say, these are the data that we know we want about our patients, and this is what we care about. We care about diagnosis codes at these level. We care about these labs and we want these labs grouped together in this way. Um, where a, a data mark that is structured around, say, um, the maternal experience may care about different types of information and organize the data slightly differently. So these are structured data that are easy for access. They're, 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 partic they're broad use cases, so they're, they're not one-off use cases, but, there are, but they're meant to really work well for a particular use case. Um, this results in a loss of information and it's such kind of a slightly higher maintenance cost than a more generalized data lake. Um, as we start thinking about data here at Duke, and now we start thinking about data at other places. So, um, you know, most of this is really I'm focusing on data that we work with here at Duke. But one of the appeals of EHR data is how can I use data that I have at Duke, and then and then talk with and work with a colleague at another institution who has similar data to do a multi-site study. That's where we start talking about the, the idea of data models, um, where and, and this is a, a schematic that I really like, where we may think about we have data from three different sources. Those data are structured in very different ways, we will transform the data to a data model. Um, um, and then, and after that transformation, now all the now all the data have made the same assumption about the data. They've organized things in the same way. And now if this is, um, you know, Duke, UNC, and Vanderbilt, all different data sources, now I have my three data sources and they now look alike. And now I, I can run analyses in parallel, or I, I can stack these data sets on top of each other to create a larger data set. So, um, so data models become a, a very powerful tool as we start thinking about how do we expand our research across institutions and across sites. Um, the data model that we use here at Duke the most, and I'll talk a little, um, is what's called the, the PCORnet um, data model. I'm not going to go in, um, this comes out of the PCORI an, an, an initiative, and it's a, um, a an, an ancestor, uh, sorry, a, a child of, of the Mini Sentinel project. Again, it, um, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, it's organized in, into really data tables that are useful for a researcher. Demographic tables, vitals tables, encounter tables, lab result tables, and one of the data access um, options I'm going to talk about and talk about more depth really builds itself off of this PCORnet data model um, and it's, 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 it's a simplified model but it's one that I think gives researchers most of the data elements that they that, that they're, they'd want for most studies um, so some advantages of data models are that, that they're simpler organization they makes it easier to access a uniform set of decisions um, there are disadvantages this particularly being a general loss of granularity where not all elements are fit within the data model and, and many measures may be grouped together so again you need to it, everything in life is trade-offs and we need to be mindful of what are the advantages or disadvantages of of the way we've organized and structured our data. But again, the, the point that I want to be really driving home is that we can't deal with the raw data. We need to make these choices at some level so that we can move forward and do the analyses we care about. Okay. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the first part in, in that what is EHR data? What does it look like? Um, the next um, phase, if you will, is 
and which I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you already have an answer to this if you're listening to this talk, but is to really try to motivate, well, why do we want to use EHR data for, for clinical research? Um, and this in some ways is, th these are really my answers, and this is what got me excited about working with these data um, eight, 10 years ago. Um, so for one, as a statistician who has, um, the, the fact that the data are readily available is just a huge advantage. Um, I can very quickly, easily, and most importantly, freely um, tap into Duke's EHR, um, pull some information, and just start running analyses. Um, all I need is myself. I need a student. I, I don't need, I'm not buying data. I'm not paying tens of thousand dollars for, for data access. The, the data are there, and, and as Duke researchers, the data are actually there for all of us. I mean, th these are our data in, in some regards, um, in terms of from a research perspective, to be able to, to learn from. And that to me is really exciting and powerful. Um, even more so, this is information, um, we may have information on hundreds of thousands or more of patients. Um, I'll, I'll give some specific data from the numbers we have at Duke, but we have large amounts of information. Um, as I've gone through, we have information over a variety of fields. Um, this allows us to study many different clinical questions. So I'm, I, I consider myself very much a generalist, and, and I really like the idea that on the same day I can be looking at a problem related to diabetes versus, and then heart disease and then surgery and then transplants. And so I don't have, you know, the, the, you have this ability to use the same data, the same knowledge base to look across a whole host of different things. Um, and also methodologically, they, they open themselves up to various methodological questions. So um, whether you're thinking about population health or you're thinking about comparative effectiveness or, or risk prediction, these data support all different types of studies. And, and again, as, as someone who enjoys working with data, that's really exciting. Um, finally, and this is something that I'd say I've really grown to appreciate more and more over the past few years, is this idea that EHR data constitute a, a real population. Um, it's something that I really try to impart on, on my students is, is that when we're working with Duke data, we're dealing with real people. Um, I do a lot of work with pediatrics. My sons are in those data sets. Um, I don't know what, what exactly their MRNs, um, I, but, but I know that my sons exist in the data sets with which we're analyzing. And these are real people, your friends, your neighbors, your teachers, your classmates may exist within these data. And, and that brings some realness to it. Um, from a population health standpoint, one of the really neat advantages of a place like Duke is is that, and again, I'll go more into this later, is that because Duke is a primary provider here in Durham County, there's a lot of really exciting opportunities for doing true population health research. Doing, um, um, with Giovanna, we're doing a study looking at the, the coverage of kids in Durham County and the demography of disease within Durham County for, for kids. Um, and we can learn something from these data that, re that relate to real people and real communities. Um, this to me is in contrast to say a clinical trial, which while very powerful in different ways is an artificial population. Even large epi cohort studies are in some ways artificial populations. These are real people, real populations that you can map back to, to, to something truly meaningful. Um, why we may not want to use EHR data for clinical research um, is again this theme of the data are not organized for research um, purposes. Um, the data exist in disparate places. All patients have different pieces of information. And the way that I talk about these is that these are your quintessential observational data. In some ways, I call them observational data on steroids, in that there's, there, it, it, if you're not comfortable with the notion of how do I think about confounding biases, selection biases, um, you can make a lot of mistakes. Um, and and it, it's where I get most concerned with you know, people just diving into the data, you need to have a good understanding of how the data were generated, that, that data generation process, to know where some challenges and biases may arise. Um, I think a lot of those challenges are resolvable or uh, through either analytic approaches or really even thoughtful study design. So I don't think these are unavoidable problems, but you need to be cognizant of them because the, the initial question you have in mind may not be answerable, but there may be a, a, a different way to restructure that question that is answerable. Okay. Um, I think it's useful to, to, to think about, and I'm not going to go in detail through this. You can look at this later if you want to, um, but, but I think it's useful to think about how these data may distinguish themselves from clinical trials data. Um, so we have um, RCT data. Um, a, and, and we can think about how the data were collected, um, when, who, and, and, and this can become ways that are useful to compare data. Sorry, just trying to be mindful of time here. OK. 
Okay. There are a few questions, but you want them at the end, right? Yeah, you know what? I, I want, we, we go till, what time do we go? We, we go till 11, correct? Uh, yes, until 11. Okay, you know, so I'm going to be a little bit mindful of time here and skip a little bit ahead. I apologize. Um, again, we can think about different studies that we can do. Um, I usually break down studies into notions of risk prediction, population health, comparative effectiveness, and association analyses. Um, there are some advantages. So with so, so with population health, we can think about the advantage of, of being able to study on a particular community. For CER, um, this opportunity to see the real world usage of medical treatments. Um, we can assess both adoption of therapies and effectiveness. Um, and from risk prediction, um, there's opportunity to contain granular information capturing patients' clinical state, as well as, and this for me again is really exciting, a direct pipeline to implement models into clinical practice. Um, I, this is a slide that I include almost in every talk is this, we need, we need a notion of collaborative clinical research with EHR data. We need, um, th there needs to be a, bio um, a biostatistician involved who's thinking about the, the, the analyses, um, informaticist who has an understanding of the data extraction, and an epidemiologist or clinician, um, or just a subject matter expert who knows that, that research question. And then all these folks really come together to think about how we work best um, with these data. Um, so in summary, for this part, uh, let's say the EHR systems are complex um, ways to store patient health data. Um, for clinical researchers, there's a lot of appealing reasons to want to work with the EHR data. Um, and the raw data almost need to be processed, um, typically through hierarchical structures, and then organizing the data into data models can aid analytics. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip this section. I really encourage folks, um, uh, uh, these slides will be posted on the Dupree website. I, I do encourage folks to, um, if you're thinking about working with these data, to, to, to look through this a little bit. Um, I do the different problems with working with EHR data. I do want to highlight the three problems, not go into detail on them. Um, there is the three challenges that I often think about are, we don't have everything we want. We need to link in outside data. Um, outcomes are not well defined. So we need to phenotype data, um, create um, compute, what are called computable phenotypes, a really important problem. Um, and then how we deal with data that are regularly or potentially densely captured. Um, I don't really, I don't want to go through, um, yeah, do you, folks can look at this on their own, but I, I want to get to what I think people are probably most interested in, which is how we actually access data. Um, this is a little case study. So this is an, an R21 we have looking at impacts of asthma exacerbation in children. Kind of gives you a sense of how we, you know, how you may structure an EHR-based research question. Again, I'll, I'll let folks um, spend a little bit of time on this uh, on their own. Um, I think this is probably the topic that people were most interested in, which is how do we actually go about accessing EHR data at Duke? So I, I hopefully I've convinced you that these data are interesting to work with. I've unfortunately um, gone ignored the fact these data can be hard and analytic challenges, so you'll go back on that on your own. Um, but this is how we actually get the data. Um, so um, EHR data at Duke. Um, D Duke University Health System, DUHS, consists of three hospitals, um, two in Durham and one in Raleigh, and a network of outpatient and specialty clinics. Um, the EHR system here is managed by Duke Health Technology Solutions, or DHTS, and they're responsible for meeting both the operations and research data needs. So they really have a, a dual function of supplying data to the hospital, organizing the EHR, keeping it up and running, providing information back to people in billing and other groups, um, you know, care management. But then they also have a, a, a university school side component that is meant to service data needs for researchers. Duke finished switching to an integrated EPIC-based system in August 2013. Um, before this, different departments had their own EHR systems. We often refer to this as, as legacy data. So this pre-2014 data um, is legacy data. They do exist, they are accessible, but they're messier, they're less reliable. Um, I generally try to avoid using legacy data, particularly now that we have up to seven years of data going back to 2014, it's becoming less and less important. Um, depending on your research question, you may still want to use it, but there's a, uh, again, there's more of a, a, a buyer beware component to knowing what you're getting involved with there. Um, for the most part, 2014 on data are going to be much more researcher accessible. Um, 
EHR data at, at Duke are big data. So since 2014, there have been over 1.7 million unique patients, over 400,000 inpatient encounters, over 27 million outpatient encounters. And these patients each have diagnoses, vitals, labs, medications, orders, et cetera. So a lot of information, a lot of exciting things as researchers we can do with these data. Um, these data are also really exciting from a population health um, standpoint. So, so DUHS is, is the primary provider of health services in Durham County. Um, this is work with a, um, with a graduate student of Giovanna's, um, of Alison Stoldi, um, where we've estimated that it, um, about 80% of Durham County residents, um, particularly children, get their health services at DUHS. This is a map um, based on census tract of coverage. Um, one hole, in, and it's actually a really important hole to note um, at, at Duke, is that there is, so um, there's Lincoln Community Health Clinics, which is a federally qualified health care provider that serves an underserved population. They share an EHR system at Duke, but special permission is needed to access their data. We are working on data use agreements with them, but you may not see data, particularly if you think about population health, you may not see data from the poorest members of our community who are more likely to go to Lincoln Health Clinics than they are to, to go to a, a Duke primary care. Um, but to give you a sense of population health and how it can be used, there's the Durham Neighborhood Compass Initiative, um, which essentially uses Duke EHR data to inform about public health in Durham County. And you, um, if you click on this link, you can look and see, uh, you know, mappings of different diseases at, um, within Durham County. Um, there's a need for pre-requirements. Um, so I, I, I always like the, the Spider-Man adage of with great power comes great responsibility. Um, most forms of EHR data contain protected health information. Um, as I mentioned, most of these patients are your neighbors, your community members. So it, these truly are not, can be non-anonymized. Um, and while data are available for minimal risk research purposes, it's important to protect the identity of patients. Um, we can get data as what we call fully identified. This may have names, date of birth, addresses. These are things that you'd go through your IRB and have to make a justification for why you needed it. So uh, the general principles that you should use, the least amount of PHI that you need to complete your study. Um, I would say for myself, I typically find myself using um, date of birth and address. It's, um, there's, I can only think of one study where I've ever needed to look at names, for example. Um, limited you can create limited data sets which will have minimal PHI, um, typically dates of service, or de-identified data which have no PHI and can technically, that, those are data you can store on, on a laptop because they're completely de-identified. Um, there are pre-requirements to being able to access data. So the first is um, city IRB training and the School of Medicine has particular IRB training modules that you have to take. So even if you've gone through the IRB training on the university side, um, you need to go through the, the School of Medicine IRB modules. You need an active IRB that's been approved by the School of Medicine. So again, this has to go through the School of Medicine IRB approval process. Typically, the data need to be stored in, in a secured, uh, on, on a secure server. Um, while data can be sent to, um, to University side servers, the most typical server, which I'll talk about is what's referred to as PACE, and they need to be stored there. And depending on the degree of direct access, and if you're gonna get PACE access, you need to have what's called a Duke Health account or a DHE account. Um, a DHE account, it's not that hard to get, but the, the main initial step is that somebody on the School of Medicine side has to initially sponsor you. So it, it, it's a very easy process for a university person, but you do need to have sponsorship by somebody on the School of Medicine side to in initiate that process. Um, the, so so the, there's, the DHTS has created what's called the Protected Analytic Compute Environment, or PACE. It's a HIPAA FISMA compliant virtual machine. Um, essentially, um, it, it, you can get one that's either Windows-based or Linux-based. Essentially, what you get is the equivalent of a, of a laptop. You get a, a virtual machine that has the equivalent resource of a laptop. Um, you can easily get data in, but you need to go through an honest broker to get data out. So that's, that's the secure aspect of it, that you can't remove PHI. Um, you cannot connect to the internet from it, but it's preloaded with R, Python, SAS, GIS, most analytic tools that you would want. And if it's not your analytic tool is not there, um, they can usually add it for you. Um, while the resources are going to a laptop, um, you can connect also to, there are partnerships being created with, with Microsoft Azure. I believe also there's an AWS connection. So you can access to, to GPU machines if that is necessary for your analytics. What I actually personally, I actually really like Pace, but I've 
kind of grown to really appreciate about PACE is that the directory structure is based off the approved IRB protocol. So this means that everybody in my project team, all my students and staff, they're working off the same, they're working off the same shared environment. So all the data are shared in one place, all the code is shared in one place, and they can all work off it together. Um, there's, I'm gonna talk about three points of access. In reality, there's more points of access here, but these are the, th these are the three main points of access to get EHR data. So we have a self-service tool called Deduce. Um, this is a GUI-based tool. Um, there are code-based tools, um, and I'm talking about one particularly called the CRDM, which is one I've personally been involved in developing. Um, and then there's, uh, these are both self-service options, and there are the option for getting expert-assisted access to work with um, a group within DHTS called ACE that can provide data to you. So, and I'm going to emphasize uh, mostly that the CRDM, because that's what I've worked with. Um, but to make me aware, so deduce um, and it um, is a GUI based system to query data. Um, it's probably the easiest way to access data. Um, you build a cohort via hierarchical queries and indicate which elements to extract. Um, the biggest challenge of this is that the, because of its, its GUI nature, the order of operations can impact the way the cohort is built. So depending on how you begin to filter out your data set, you, you know, if you put, I want men before the age, you may get something slightly different. Um, and, and so it doesn't, um, and, and because it's GUI based, you cannot run your, your queries um, repeatedly. Um, so therefore it doesn't have a high degree of natural reproducibility. It's really good for kind of a quick one-off, um, low, low cost access way to get initial data. Um, it's something maybe, it, particularly if, you, if you, you don't have a lot of coding and, um, skills that you want to just look at something quickly yourself, it could be quite useful. The data in, in Deduce do go back to, to the 90s, but data pre-2014 again may be less reliable. Um, partially in, in response to um, some of the limitations of, do, um, of the DUCE, um, I've been part of a team where we've built up what's called the Clinical Research Data Mart or, or, or the CDRM. This um, is an offering for, um, that with joint support from um, the Children's Health and Discovery Initiative, translating Duke Health, CTSI, and DHTS. Um, you can access the website here. Um, it's designed to support clinical research and development of clinical re registries. Um, we built this to meet a few principles. Um, first, that data pools need to be re reproducible um, to provide a code-based access to a broader range of analysts. Um, the, there's, we kind of, when we structured this, that most data queries don't need the most up-to-date data. So there's a lag in some of the data right now. We're working to resolve that lag, but there is a, up to a two to three month lag in the data you can get, but most research purposes, that, that won't be a problem. Most studies use many of the same data elements, ICDs, labs, medications, and that the data should be linkable to other data assets, such as department-specific data marts, public, publicly available contextual data, et cetera. So, and, and, and this, this is going through active development where, with new data tables to meet researchers' needs. Um, for example, working on, on a family linkage table um, as a response to needs from, from COVID researchers right now. Um, so, the, so the CRDM is organized as an extension of the PCORnet common data model. Um, so as mentioned, PCORnet contains most data elements. Um, we've added additional tables such as provider information, encounter details. Um, I'd say the, the biggest hole in the data are you don't have details on the hospital encounter. So there's no timestamps around bed flow, um, timestamps of, of vital signs. So if you really need that, that granular hospital encounter, that's not going to be, this won't be the data source for you. Um, it only contains data starting in 2014. Um, the data are, are, are refreshed and, and quality controlled and um, quarterly. Um, and then what we're working on is a way to create a daily re refresh. And the data um, sit within an Oracle database that can be accessed from within PACE via R, Python, or SAS. Um, so what's really, what I really like about this is that um, I can write code from, so I can write, I'm an R person, I can write code within R. Um, I can use um, RDOBC to create a, a SQL connection to the Oracle database query, pull the data into my R environment, and, and then run all my analytics. And now I have a full code base that's fully reproducible that I, I can regenerate that code as often as I want to, to pull in data and, and rerun analyses. Um, again, a kind of a, a basic structure is that we're, we're taking Duke Health data, we're moving it into, in, into the data model, and then off of this, we would have each individual projects, which may also bring in geospatial data, department-specific data marts, or, or other types of data sets. 
um, to get access to, to the CRDM. Um, and, and I believe I may do in the fall um, on, um, for folks who are interested um, through uh, Dupree, uh, a more kind of detailed, how do you access CRDM? Um, you need to obtain um, IRB or RPR approval to access EHR data. You need a, K a PACE account. Um, you, um, we ask you to fill out a, a red cap registry so we can kind of track projects. Um, and then after that, you just need to reinitiate the connection. And once you have that connection, you're free to, to pull data um, as your IRB would allow. I'm not going to go through this, but these are a variety of use cases um, across various fields that, that we've been using the CRDM for. Um, and then finally, we have ACE fee for service. So um, this is a component of, of DHTS. Um, th and, and this is a team of informaticists who can perform custom data pools and data services, building out data marts, creating APIs for you. Um, this, because this is a, this is a, the first two options are ostensibly free services. Um, the data are there for users to access. Um, this does require paying someone to do the work for you. So, and cost and time is largely dependent on the complexity of, of the data domains requested. Um, this is most useful when you need unstructured data elements or detailed hospital flow data. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time. I wanna leave a little bit of time for, for questions at the end, but it kind of gives you some, you know, some comparisons about how these data um, a, a, versions um, may may differ um, and again I, I I tend to believe be a believer that all options have a good use case um, there is no so th so this is a lot of information so the question all comes up how do I navigate this um, I encourage people so he, uh, I encourage people to look at, at the data services catalog um, which can help people navigate the clinical services here at Duke um, so this is um, this is the website for the data services catalog. It gives information on a whole host of data that are options here at Duke. Um, I'm actually I'm thinking about this, Giovanna, we should probably add some of Dupree's data to this, but data from Population Health, data from um, Cancer Institute, the Clinical Research Data Mart, DCRI data. Um, so this is a great resource for folks to find out information, to get specific information on um, navigating the EHR system, um, DHTS has put together um, the EARS group, which um, stands for EHR Enabled Research Support Group. Um, again, it can help users really help them to understand how to navigate the, the system and help connect them with the right data resources that are, that are there for their project. Um, so in so, kind of, so in summary, um, I, I hope I've convinced you all of is that the Duke EHR system contains a wealth of information on, on patient health. Um, the data present opportunities to study population health within Durham County. This is an area where we've done some really exciting research on. And each data can be quite complex, both structurally and epidemiologically, and that there are multiple ways to access d d data here at Duke. Um, I'm gonna see if I stop you, sharing, ben. if I can see some of the okay now I can see all the questions That's you great. can see that well then you should take them starting from E1 okay so I'm gonna okay so I'm gonna take okay um okay a lot of people telling me how I could have done this um posted um the host can okay okay so what's the process of what so what's the process of, of exploring either data lakes or marks to get the right data for a specific question um so so that so there's a so there's a variety of data marts. I'm going to talk more about data marts. Um, so there is a variety of data marts that exist across the, the School of Medicine. As I mentioned, a, a lot of departments have created their own data marts. So for example, um, OBGYN has created what they call the Stork um, Universe or Stork Data Mart, um, which covers information about birth encounters. So if you're someone who's thinking, I want to know something about birth encounters, I want to do research on birth outcomes, what you'd really have to partner with around is some Somebody within OBGYN and understand what data um, they've organized and pulled in. Um, and so those are more the, the department specific data marts. Um, Heart Center has their own data mart, Transplant has their own data mart. We can also think about then the data. I would put the CRDM as a more generalized data mart as well, which will, um, which kind of gives a, a broader access. But if what you if what you desire are those really specific types of data structures or data elements partnering with those particular departments is, is at this point is likely the best case. Um, is billing data cost for um, easily available? Um, no. So there is obviously a lot of billing information. There's a lot of cost information. For obvious reasons, um, those data are not 
readily available to researchers. Um, those data can be available for particular use cases and contexts. Um, I've personally worked with our billing data and our cost data. Um, we, we have restrictions on when we can publish with them or not. Um, those are really more what we, we would call for QI or quality improvement purposes. What about e EMS and pre-hospital care data? Is that easily accessible in the formats you described from EPIC? Um, yeah, so, and, and that's actually really interesting. Because, um, so again, the, um, the project I mentioned around traumatic brain injury, we're particularly thinking about those data. Those data typically exist in unstructured form. So pre-hospital reports, um, EMS care, those are not gonna be organized within structure, currently typically within structured data elements. Um, just, to, just to double check, family members can be linked, right? Um, so this is actually a, a really um, timely pertinent question. It's something that we're actively working on. So, and it's nuanced. Um, the only time that family members are linked is at the birth encounter. So at the time of birth, a mother and child, their, their MRNs are linked at that time. After that, there's no explicit linkage of family members. Now, that being said, there are ways that we can start thinking about family linkage with, with EHR data. Um, there are fields within EPIC that, that allow you to mention who your mother, your father are. They're not well populated, as you may guess. There are fields that allow you to mention emergency contact, contact which may or may not be a family member. What we're actually working on is trying to look at how can we use addresses to, and what I don't like, I don't like calling it family members, but I like calling it cohabitation. So in principle, we can look at two people who are living at the same address at the same time and say they're cohabitating together. Now, I don't know if that's a, brother and sister or just two roommates or I don't know if, it, if it's a father and son or a fa or an uncle and, and nephew but we can look at people who are living together at the same time depending on your research question that may or may not be enough for you so what we're looking at for example in, in, in the COVID world is adults who test positive can we identify children who are living with them to, to do um, proactive outreach but there is no explicit family linkage aside from the birth encounter. Um, how does um, how does Oasis research factor into those that have you listed? Um, so Oasis is a relatively newer organization within Duke. I'm sorry, um, that is a, a team to help organize data. So the, um, so, so they put together the Duke data catalog. Um, they, there's there's informaticists within Oasis who can help um, and can help users get access to data. Um, can OR data be retrieved? Um, Anesthesia type time ASA code. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so there. So we're working actually on, on a COVID related OR project right now. Um, and we have extremely granular data on the time when, when anesthesia started, um, the dosages of anesthesia. Anesthesia itself, um, it, an anesthesia is actually one of the more interesting informatics groups in the sense that they've they, historically anesthesiologists have organized data much longer than other groups. So there's actually a standing anesthesiology data mart that has really granular information on interoperative vital signs um, that goes back pre-epic data. Um, so there's a lot, and there's a lot of really great anesthesiology researchers here who are very informatics data savvy. So yes, there's a lot of really great OR data um, available. Um, okay, comment on the recommended approach for converting EHR data into a tidy data, a data set suitable for analysis and the importance of, of, of vapor hypotheses and a SAP to protect against p-hacking. And yes, yeah, so, um, so I definitely glossed over how we go from a data mark to an analytic data set. That was in the slides I skipped. Um, that's a process. And that's kind of where I think about the handoff from the informatician to the biostatistician. So the informatician is extremely well-skilled at pulling data, getting data, out to you into a, um, and, then, and then the job in my mind of that, of that biostatistician say, what is the particular research analysis I'm doing and how do I organize that? And for every analysis you run, those data may need to be organized in a slightly different way. So that in and of itself is a second layer process. It's why I actually like the CRDM environment is because I can organize my informatics code with my statistics code. So my informatics code, if you will, is my querying of the SQL database to pull data into my R environment, that immediately feeds into say dplyr, which then turns all those data tables that I've queried into an actual analytic data set. 
Um, and yes, it, it, I mean, from the, the importance of a priori hypotheses, we're in the world of big data. You can ask lots of questions and you need to be cognizant of what is the way you're organizing your data. Um, I think and, and the way you're designing your study, these are great for exploratory data analysis, but I actually, I actually get almost sad when, when people think about these data and only want to do descriptive analyses. There is, you can really do inferential analysis with, with, with these data. We can, we, I'm, I've been working with the FDA. I'm a big believer that we can do drug approval, um, drug safety monitoring, comparative effectiveness with EHR data. But if you're going to do that, you need to be very responsible with how you set up those research questions, use best principles of study design, statistics, et cetera. But there's a lot of really great inference that can come out of this. Um, so some data marts owned by a particular department is closed to certain people, meaning not available for all to conduct research. Um, I would, I don't want to be, um, so, I would say that they require partnerships. So it's there. I say departments have invested in creating data resources for their departmental faculty, and um, for a variety of reasons. A lot of it is substantive reasons. I think there are legitimate substantive reasons why they don't want to just hand over data to, to other groups because they may not un, un, misunderstand it. Um, so I say there, but I, what I would say, and I think this is a, a culture of Duke in general, there's a very strong co collaborative culture where you may not be able to just be given access and free reign to a department specific database, but collaborating with people, particularly if you're a a, um, a technically oriented person and have the anal analytic skills to partner with someone who has those substantive clinical skills can be really powerful. So what you have in most of these clinical departments are clinicians who know the data really well, but maybe don't have the analytic skills or um, to analyze it and manipulate it in the right way. So I think there's a lot of room for, for really strong partnerships. Um, I may have, um, who would be a contact if we were interested in extracting data, DHTS? Yeah, so if you're interested in, in extracting data, there is, um, th there are various ways to, to again, to, to hit the EHR data. Um, I, I encourage reaching out to, to EARS, for example, if you kind of want an overview of the process. Um, if you kind of know that you want to go, if something like the CRDM makes a lot of sense for you, you, you kind of know that these are the data that, that I need. Um, then, and where we're putting together some training modules for that, then you can then you can directly access in that regard as well. Um, what is the process for linking to department-specific data, CRDM to department-specific databases? Um, so yeah, so that's something that we're actively working on right now is creating those partnerships. So the 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 ideal structure of the CRDM is that we have a full denominator of all patients who've come to Duke, but maybe we're missing some of the contextual information. So we don't have, for example, ejection fraction in there, but the heart centers data mart does. So what we're now working, and, and similarly with birth encounter, we don't have all the details on the birth encounter, but the stork data mart does. So what, so I'd say that the next phase within the CRDM is how do we begin to create those linkages so that you can start querying across those d databases. Um, a colleague of mine, Nupin Bausar, is working on organizing GIS data um, and American Community data. So again, it'll be more directly linkable with these data sources. Um, with the current Duke data system, are you confident that all pieces of info are, are pulled completely, or is it possible that certain pieces of data are not pulled? So great question. Um, so I don't, I don't want to repeat that, make sure. So are, am I confident that all pieces of info are pulled completely? I often say there is no truth in EHR data. I do not believe if you know, if, if you asked me how many diabetics there are in in, in Duke's EHR system, I don't believe there is a true. I, I believe there's a true number that exists. I don't believe we can ever know that true number, and so much of it is dependent on the data that I pull, the way I pull it, the way I define things, the way I define what a diabetic is. So I didn't go, I didn't have a chance to go into detail about creating computable phenotypes and, and data definitions. But there's an entire process of how we create data definitions. So I'm not a believer that there is a truth to, to, that we can ever find. What I am a believer in is that whatever process we define for pooling data, we need to be consistent in that process. So I believe more in, in reproducibility. So we may not always, so you may define a process one way and I may define a process another. We may get different answers. That to me is okay. What we want to be clear about is that every time we do something, we do it in a, in a consistent way. Um, and one of the things that, 
um, that the Duke um, House of Enterprise is becoming more conscious of is that as an enterprise, we want to be doing more and more things in a consistent way. So as we start thinking about data structures, we don't want to be relying on all different types of data structures. We want to have centralized data resources so that everybody's pulling data from the same place so that we get more and more similar answers. So if you're pulling data from one environment and I'm pulling from a different environment, we may get different answers. If we're pulling from the same environment and using the same processes, hopefully we'll start getting the same answer. So this notion of truth it, it, um, is, is quite complicated and subtle. Um, we have a de-identified data set created by ACE. Is there a procedure to liberate it from PACE? Um, I, I like the word liberate. Um, so in principle, if you've de-identified it, then you can go through the honest broker and that, and, and, and you should be able to extract it out. That being said, it also depends on your IRB. So the, you need to have, that IRB needs to specify where those data can exactly live. Um, what's the price of linking HR data, Durham County administrative data in, in other domain, um, to Durham County administrative data in other domains? Um, again, that's something that we're working through um, as well. Um, there's, I, and, and I know um, Dupree has done a lot of great work in terms of organizing various forms of administrative data, right? And, and one thing that I'd love to see is a greater consolidation of really how do we bring those data sources together. There are some data that we're never, that we're not allowed to link together. For example, school records data. Um, the Durham, um, Durham Public Instruction DPI has interpreted state law that says you can't, um, can't li link bi um, biometric data with uh, biological data with school data to mean that you can't link EHR data with school data without explicit approval. So some administrative data sources we can't link together. But what we are trying to figure out is how can we bring more and more of these data sources um, together? And th that is an active area that we're working through. Um, are waveform data being captured and stored in, in, in Duke EHR? Um, e ECG data. Um, I don't, I'm not I'm not the best person to ask for that. I know, that I, I be, my understanding is that it's more and more so, it doesn't go back historically. I know it's something that groups are actively working on. It's not an area that I work as specifically, so I haven't encountered that as an issue as much. Um, I believe that, that it's starting to, I, I know you can capture it prospectively. I believe that there are data marks that are not, that are organizing it. If anyone knows that answer, you know, please feel free to chime in. I'm, I, I'm not 100% clear on what exactly the, the, the status quo right now is for waveform data. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, Relinking with school records, even linking by zip code is not allowed. Um, um, again, I'm not the, um, I'm not sure about the zip code. Um, again, I'm not sure, also I'm not sure that what that would tell you given the fact that kids in Durham at least go to a lot of different places. So in principle, you can use aggregated data, right? So, you, so if you knew something about a community school, um, the, the school in your community, you can link that. And, and if you wanted to make it, a, you can use that aggregated school level data linked to, to kids in that community. That being said, given the nature of schools in Durham where kids go to a lot of private schools and, and go to non-community schools, charter schools, I'm not sure how useful that would necessarily be. Um, and yes, no, I, um, um, I, I, Giovanna, if you can post um, where they'll be perfect. Thank you. Yes, no, we'll, we'll get the slides posted. Um, this talk will be posted. And, and, and my hope is that this actually is not the end of a conversation, but the beginning of a conversation about how we access to EHR data. Um, my hope and intention of talking to Giovanna about this is in the fall to do a more specific training around how we access um, the CRDM. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, what I'd encourage you to do is begin the process of, uh, of, uh, begin the process of, of getting the access protocols so that we can do a hands-on training. Um, I see um, um, Suresh chimed in that there is no waveform data, but the infrastructure is being developed. Um, and that was my understanding, correct? Thank you. Um, and again, um, my, my email information is very easy to find. Please feel free to, to reach out to me um, as well. And I'll probably connect you with somebody else um, who, can, who can help um, in, in any way too. But um, there's a lot of great people who are thinking about these data in a whole host of different ways. I think there's a great opportunity for, for partnerships here. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. This was uh, very informative and there will be more of this. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, I posted the uh, website where the talk will be, or the link to the talk will be posted within about a week. 
and uh, we'll keep everybody everybody informed on uh, sort of the next uh, event, hopefully in person, uh, given that uh, that might be a hands-on easier probably, uh, but uh, you know, in the fall. Thank you everybody for coming. We had Thank you. 68 participants at the peak. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Thanks. Thank you, Ben.